All right. Thank you all for um, I'm not used to moving chairs, much less at this hour of the day. But thank you all for, for coming out here. It's wonderful to see so many people. Um, my, my name is Adam Braver. I'm the uh, library program director, also on, on faculty in uh, the uh, creative writing program, and some of you from your first year experience as well. So we've got quite a mix in here. Um, and welcome to our first talk in the library program um, of 2023-24. Uh, this series is endowed by alumna Mary Teft White, uh, with her vision uh, was to bring outside voices onto the campus in order to inspire students through learning about different people's experiences um, and cultures. And today we welcome Dr. Alfred Babo. <laughs> there are some people you want to know as soon as you meet them. Such was the case with Alfred, who I met through our mutual connection with Scholars at Risk, of which Alfred was a scholar at risk. Immediately, it became clear to me that I was in the company of someone with amazing intellect, warmth, presence, and with a fire in his eyes. Our interactions carried on through curious encounters, running into each other during a 2 a.m. layover in Dublin, which led to a two-hour conversation. Another occasion found both of our flights being canceled at the end of a conference in New Orleans, leading to an afternoon and evening together wandering the city, and later again finding each other at yet a different layover in Charlotte, North Carolina. And less surprising, but nevertheless meaningful, in a room with student advocates at Alfred's home campus at Fairfield University. All this to say, that each time I'm with Alfred, I walk away feeling as though I am a better person and a more informed person. And true, he is more than his story as an exile from Cote d'Ivoire, forced to escape after receiving multiple death threats, for having the courage to speak on the effects of the vicious civil war on the higher education community. And though that period is something I imagine Alfred will talk about, it is his experiences as a scholar, one who had to endure life-altering threats and risks and danger for his ideas that also allow him to speak with expertise on today's topic about misinformation and how it threatens democracies around the world. So please welcome Alfred. Bye -bye. Thank you, Adam. And uh, I would like to take the chance to thank everyone. Is that okay? Do you hear me now? Thank you. Um, so I was uh, saying thank you to everyone who, you know, made uh, this possible for me to be here. This is my second time coming here. And uh, I'm always happy to, to be on this campus, beautiful campus. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, take the opportunity to share, of course, to go beyond my own personal experience and also share some reflection on the topic that have been suggested to me. And uh, of course, I'll be happy at the end of this talk to uh, answer your questions, uh, have a conversation with you. That's uh, what I expect. So uh, maybe to go uh, straight to the to the topic, I I I will be uh, discussing. Uh, I will, should have say disinformation, misinformation, right, and propaganda, and all those things. Are how it's uh, uh, related to democracy? Okay, how is it impacting democracy? So uh, I can start with my own brief story. Right? I'm an anthropologist. I'm from Ivory Coast, Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, which is in West Africa. So we are uh, a, which is a francophone country, so that means I speak French and I did all my you know, uh, scholarship, my uh, you know, young uh, career as a researcher in my country, as a student in my country. I never dreamed being you know, in the United States. I, I came in the United States as a scholar uh, with a scholarship in 2006. My country was already in trouble, but uh, I decided to go back home and uh, 
I I would go every time in Europe, in Switzerland, where I, where I did my uh, postdoc research. And actually, I never thought that I would be out of my country. And uh, I was hoping that everything would be OK. But unfortunately, uh, we used one powerful instrument of democracy, which is elections. Right? We thought that election will be the gateway, will be the solution to address the long political and uh, military crisis in my country, which started in 2002 when I was a graduate student preparing my PhD, ready to, uh, to go for my defense. And uh, I woke up in the middle of the night with uh, uh, gunshots. You know, everyone were running away, and I didn't know what to do. The only thing I tried to grab was uh, my discussion. At that time, maybe you, you're too young, you don't, you don't uh, maybe you did not have the experience of having the, the discus. We, we had some small discus, they flat like this. So I had a, uh, five of them because of pictures in my discussion. So I, you cannot put it on one disc. So I had all of them and uh, flip flops and uh, try to find a way out. And at that time, I was uh, in a town called Boaké, which is uh, around 300 kilometers from uh, Abidjan, the capital city. So my goal was to reach the capital city, where this place was safer. So I was what we call uh, internal IDPS. Probably you have heard that, internal displaced person. So I moved. Uh, after, I, I won't be long on that, but uh, it was difficult for me to leave this town and reach uh, Abidjan in, uh, in you know, one night of uh, October 20, 2002. So I stayed there. I did, I got myself, uh, I put myself uh, together after the trauma and uh, I, Continuing and you know did my dissertation, and my discussion, and then got my doctorate degree. And after that, as I said, I came to the U.S. I went, I traveled a lot, and I was uh, as a scholar, I was hoping that things would be you know fixed through election. So how come something which was supposed to be the one of the interesting uh, principle of democracy will instead you know, create more trouble in the country. So in 2010, 2011, in 2010, we're supposed to hold the presidential election that will end the crisis, the political crisis in my country. Unfortunately, because of misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, then this election turned into civil war. So at that point, I was not uh, internal displaced anymore. I was then a refugee. I left, I had to leave my country with my kids, my wife, and cross the border and uh, find my way towards Ghana, uh, the east of Ivory Coast, and then uh, later in uh, a Francophone country, which is Togo, uh, the capital city. So the idea for me was to avoid English because I'm a Francophone, right? And uh, I was like, uh, I'm not staying in Ghana. Because Ghana, they speak English. I don't want to stay here. And uh, here I am, right? I, that's life. You never know. You know, I was fleeing. I was trying to avoid English country. And uh, I'm now in the United States. <laughs> that's how life, you know. So now uh, I'm an anthropologist. and. Uh, after resisting for a couple of years, I have now to assume my role as a director of the International Studies Program at Fairfield University. So that has been a long you know, way, and I would like uh, to uh, take the chance to share the, uh, this path with you. So when you are a refugee, of course, you are a refugee and scholars, you have two sides of your 
you know, your life that you have to resume with. Uh, of course, you have to catch up. You have to to start over your social life and uh, take care of your own your, yourself take care of your family but at the same time you have to resume what's you you know your career how do you get a job how do you teach and uh, for uh, a couple of years I have been uh, thinking about you know how I connect what happened to my to me how things like democracy have been so misrepresented in Africa, that we, instead of uh, being involved and take advantage of what democracy is, we are fighting, right? We're killing each other because of elections, because of, the, you know, and I will, uh, I want to open up a little bit on how this is happening in the world. So we can understand that uh, lying and, uh, you know, playing with uh, truth, in uh, politics is not something which is only in one part of the world, but uh, even in democratic nations, how they're playing with, you know, lies, how they, you know, uh, they're playing with uh, truth, that's they call alternative, you know, uh, um, uh, fact, and ultimately how this is uh, undermining democracy, and beyond that, how we're creating refugees or people like me because of a lie, right? We never think that having a refugee somewhere here in our town, right? It could be based on the fact that one prominent politician lied on something. It never occurred to us, right? So I want to make this connection for us to understand and uh, hopefully they will help, help us uh, have a conversation. So briefly, I will go over some definitions. And of course, uh, I had some questions and hypotheses. And uh, I will go over some of the key arguments that I have. I hope I will go quickly so we can have time to, to have a, a conversation. So I will go with uh, those definitions. <coughs> So I see this information, as you can see, as the fact that we can transform the fact, right? The, 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 uh, the factualization of the, of the world that stem from a corrupt political institutions. So the person who is already playing, you know, uh, to this with the fact is corrupt, right? The other thing that we can pay attention to is uh, how now the trend, the new trend of social media has, of course, developed this possibility of disinformation. So the way you type on your laptop or on your phone, one thing you say could be playing with a friend, right? Saying something like that, you want to prank someone, you say, you know, you write an information, something happening on campus today. Uh, maybe it was a question for you, you because you forget the question mark, right? then it would become something which is not a question anymore, and it will go, and it's for you the time to realize it's already as a actual information. Okay, so social media played uh, a lot on that. And for that you have uh, how social media used for many people to spread lies and cancel truth. And we know a lot of countries which have created and institutionalized this way of you know doing politics okay <clears throat> of course then you have the political disinformation which is uh, how disinformation is uh, seems something which is becoming central to political activities right what does it mean so we can go further and see you know how um it plays with some concrete examples so here for example i'm putting here how um a, uh, in one of the articles that I shared with uh, with you, that the place where disinformation has spread wide, widest and deepest is the U.S. Highest level of junk news circulation. Conspiracy theories have also become viral. So one of the conspiracy theories that we know, uh, for example, in Europe, um, is related to race or the great uh, replacement. I don't know if you have heard about that, but uh, with this thing that, uh, oh, these Arabs are coming to replace us, or these uh, Mexicans are coming to replace us, or these Africans are coming to replace us, right? So change the demographic of our population. Not only the demographic, but the 
the existence of our country, the existence of our identity. So that is how it plays. And we can see in the United States here, the election of 2016 and 2020 were very uh, interesting to see how this information worked. So once we use this disinformation, it's, uh, it, become, it, it, it will integrate what we call propaganda based on where, how it spreads, how quickly it spreads, and what kind of technology we use, and with what intent. That is how propaganda will play here. So of course, we know that it's biased, but it doesn't prevent us from spreading the information. Sometimes we know that oh, this is not accurate, but you're still sharing the information. Right? You're still you know, uh, sharing that information with your friend, and it's circulating. Okay? <clears throat> so some a couple of uh, definitions here. The historian defined propaganda as narrowly selfish. Right? It's something selfish, and it's uh, in the interest of a particular person or particular group. Okay? So why are you spreading or you know, circulating information that you certainly know that is wrong or is not true? or you don't have any evidence to support that, right? So, in the interest of a particular person. Propaganda is also the management of collective attitude with the idea to manipulate significant symbols. So manipulation is also something that happens here. We can also see how it's uh, an effort to create or shape things. So sometimes you know the truth, but you will add some you know, details that will change maybe the meaning or you know the form, but uh, you will recreate the information, you will refabric the information with a specific intent. So it's deliberately designed to influence opinions or actions. Okay. So with the development of technology, we can say now it's also integrating you know uh, the way we use to uh, for persuasion. Okay, to make sure that what we think, what we say is you know make it through okay by using technology then we can go back we can uh, finish with democracy and try to see how it's uh, uh something which is uh of course that has been praised uh in our uh, society today and uh as i said if it's something which is so good now uh, then we have to wonder why democracy which is supposed to be you know, providing wealth, uh, um, well-being, which is supposed to provide peace, is creating in some nations more war. Okay, how do we even bring kind of democracy with weapons? Right. So think about what happened with Afghanistan. Right. The U.S. thought that they will spring, they will spread democracy in this country by sending militaries there, you know, we, we force democracy in this nation. But uh, 20 years later, nothing happened that, you know, that, that they planned. And in many African countries, as I said, we have been fighting for democracy for the last 30 years, and we still have more civil wars than democratic regimes. Okay. So someone like Joseph Schumpeter says, uh, democracy sees democracy as a system in which people have the opportunity of accepting or rejecting their leaders. So we have the chance to say, you know, to say something as citizens, right? To be part, to participate and to be part of the process. And liberal democracy, so the, you know, that's another thing. Uh, democracy emphasizes the separation of powers, so check and balance, and different uh, uh, institutions in in this uh, system. Okay especially multi-parties, party system, and protection of freedom. Those are uh, really important freedom of speech and freedom of expression. That's what we see, how it's related to disinformation and misinformation. Okay? Am I free to say whatever I want, even if I know that it's, it's wrong, it's not true, or it has no evidence, right? because of freedom of expression or freedom of speech, can I say that? Even if I'm aware that it could be very harmful uh, you know, down the road. So that's also how we should question democracy as we, we think. One thing we have, uh, uh, I, I took from uh, 
Anna Arendt's uh, uh, paper and her work, that lie, lies have, be, have become part of the fabric of daily life. So if this is true, then we have, you know, we should be concerned about, and it's not only for politicians, probably <laughs> for all of us, right? Is it something which is part of our uh, life? So why have lies always been regarded as necessary and justifiable tools for politicians? Okay, uh, why is the search for truth? Now people are looking for truth because lies have so uh, been around us. So now we're thinking that we need to double check things. Okay, and what are the consequences of disinformation and propaganda on democracy and society? <coughs> Some hypotheses, lies have always been inherent to politics, whether it's domestic or international, okay? And but have recently triggered the rise of disinformation, which is uh, acute in old and traditional democratic nations. So as long as uh, it was, ha you know, lies were happening in, in about other nations for foreign relations, people were not really concerned, you know, especially, but when we see how lies have been part of uh, uh, political activities, political rhetoric, political discourses in all traditional democratic nations, then people think that we should be, you know, concerned about what's going on because at that point, we are, we're going, to, we're touching the foundations of, you know, what we believe to be democratic. So that's that's how it's uh, uh, important. Second hypothesis is uh, playing on the edge of the truth in politics weakens democracy. And if we believe that democracy is the best system, then we should be aware of different factors that are undermining democracy. Okay. So truth and politics have never stood on common ground. So I would like to maybe uh, present a brief video here, which is a short video. And uh, maybe some of you have heard, have already seen that video. Okay, I don't know if some of you have uh, seen this, but we can, um, we notice that this is happening first in terms of institution, it's happening at the UN, right? And UN uh, Security Council, so that's the, the top level. Second, the person who is speaking is uh, a top administration of the American government was okay Colin Powell and of course it's really it's, it's talking about how Iraqi government is lying on something that will trigger later the invasion of Iraq by the US Army okay so here is the one talking about Iraq Iraqi government lying then what happens yeah, uh, years later. Anyone has a, a thought? What do you think happened from this? No one want to try? Yes, please. The invasion of Iraq. Yes, if invasion of Iraq. Then. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, lies about um, about all WMDs and mass destruction. They, they did what, sorry? Um, basically weapons of mass destruction and their lives. Okay. So there, it happened that there were no massive, there was no weapon of massive destruction there. Okay. But that happened after we had many Iraqis killed. Of course, American soldiers killed. And uh, 
many and millions of Iraqi refugees in the world. That is, later we realized that this was fake and it wasn't, there were no evidence about that. So you can understand to, you know, to what extent lies can go you know, to the top of the top, okay? By those who have the power and those who have, you know, uh, uh, who control the biggest institutions in the world. And as I said, this is happening at the UN. And of course, uh, we can say, so why other countries did not react? Why the other nations, in, you know, because that's the UN, right? Why the other nations did not react? So that is how you see the leverage, okay? So we can go from there to see how uh, the best way to discuss lies is uh, to think, to confront lies and truth in politics. So here, uh, Arendt, for example, mentioned how in terms of truth, we have a variety of truth. Of course, you have historical truth, those who, that you will find in the history of every nation, every country, every community. You have some facts, and uh, our, we were having a lunch, having lunch uh, a few hours ago, where we were discussing about the history, for example, of, you know, Bristol, okay, and uh, other, other, other towns in the United States, where some, you know, stories, actual facts, you know, are kind of coming up, okay, people are learning what's happening in this, what happened in the society. So she listed a lot of uh, 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 truth, and uh, she wanted to really make the uh, the, the, the emphasis on the factual truth. How do we connect truth to fact? Okay. Of course, when you connect truth to politics, you have also the political rhetoric that distorts and refigures truth. So rhetoric will be used for, by many uh, politicians to play around with, of course, the truth. Whether we can distort some of the aspects where you can present a different aspect of it, okay? And the truth isn't political. Uh, factual truth is in great danger of disappearance because more and more we can play with it. And uh, of course, uh, uh, as long as it's in politics, people tend to think that it's pretty okay as long as it's in politics. Why? Because we have one specific goal, okay? And uh, Philosophy and truth, here we understand why people will lie and why people will be playing with truth. What is the moral aspect of it? What is the rational aspect of it? Okay, when we, we put together empiricism and uh, rationalism, do we, do we deal with truth based on our personal experience or based on you know, how we think uh, truth should be? As we move forward with propaganda, we see that uh, propaganda is connected to the lie, to the fact that lie, lies has always been instrumental to gaining political advantage. So people don't do things for nothing, okay? To gain something, favor. So here I'm taking, for example, the, uh, the case of COVID-19, okay? That was an interesting case where the uh, former administrations thought that uh, you know, we can say it, it's just a flu, it's, it's nothing dangerous, it's fine. But the danger of that was the fact that it was risky for public health, for all of us. And the consequence of that, it was uh, the fact that we had to slow down people's reaction and all measures that we took later in this country to kind of you know, slow, slow down the spread were delayed because for a long time, we didn't want to acknowledge that this disease was serious, okay? Of course, during the Cold War and uh, during wartime, World War I, uh, different, even uh, the current war in, uh, uh, between Israel and uh, Hamas, uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia, during wars, that's the best time for people to, you know, to use any, any information, any tools for propaganda, okay, for their own gain, of course, okay? The way that we tell the story will be different. And of course, intelligence services will be playing, will be used, you know, to uh, reinvent, rewrite the story about something that happened, 
Okay, it could be bombing. Uh, I think uh, yesterday it was about uh, yesterday or two, two days ago it was about bombing the hospital in uh, in Gaza. And right now, uh, uh, everyone is saying we don't know who did that, or you know. <laughs> so we're trying to find where it comes from. Okay, so of course intelligence services are playing that, and of course we also know that propaganda is also something people, uh, powerful nation use for political and geostrategic hegemony, okay? And uh, that can also play for uh, the global governance, especially for someone who come from a, a country that have been colonized uh, uh, for a long time. And uh, again, we're talking about uh, colonization, how uh, when the story is uh, written by the colonizers, it's uh, different from the, 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 the colonized, right? Okay. Those who colonize will present the beautiful part of you know, what they did. Okay. Form of propaganda use uh, main, mainly three, uh, three, three, three ways. The bandwagon, okay, convince the audience to do or believe something because everyone else is doing it. So, as I said, because you spread something, you believe that you know it's true. Uh, and uh, you have the glittering uh, generality, positive meaning. Okay, we give a bit positive meaning. We try to give a positive meaning to something, even if we believe that we see that is is wrong. And of course, repetition is one form that people use for propaganda. Right? We repeat, we repeat, and because we repeat, we think we 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 ultimately start believing it. But uh, and we are convinced that other people will also, you know, believe it. Okay? So can, repetition can go from different, something wrong like, uh, so when uh, think about Russia or China, the way the terms that have been, will be used in American media or European media, talking about someone like Putin, they will be talking about a dictator, okay? So the term, the term that's used to talk about the president of Russia or the president of you know, uh, China, this term means something. It's, it's not, they're not just using it because they don't have any other words, right? So it means something. They want to describe it and they want to repeat it. They repeat it. So you young people, you can understand and you can connect you know, dictatorship with this guy, right? When you, someone asks you any idea of dictatorship, of course, you'll be thinking about Putin because you have heard that too much, right, in the media, the mainstream media, that's how they play, okay? Now, maybe that they're, they're right. I don't, I'm not saying they're, they're wrong, but I'm saying, I'm explaining how it plays, right? Okay. So this information in uh, uh, democracy is playing with alternative facts, okay? So now more and more people are talking about alternative facts. So how fact would be, how can we have alternative to fact? Fact is a fact, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> of course, uh, you remember uh, the, the debate or controversy around <laughs> President Trump uh, uh, inauguration, okay? They were talking about the, you know, the number of uh, people who attending this inauguration. They are comparing with uh, President Obama's inauguration, and there were kind of controversy about the numbers, who was kind of more popular. And some people were saying, this is alternative fact, right? So, you, so it's good for you to question that how fact could be, you know, can have alternative. So, lies is consistent with lying, and consistent lying, loss of facts. So the result is that because we're looking always for alternative facts, of course, at the end of the day, we're kind of wondering where is the fact, where is the truth in these things. And uh, this information is also not by ordinary people, but even by leaders, institutions, you know, mainstream media, okay? And uh, it goes with manipulation, censorship, abuses, okay? And I can give more uh, example when I go to the timeline that I, I, I have uh, next. And uh, of course, as I say, development of technology and the big data is also, and social media are, of course, uh, making the manipulation of information on uh, uh, as uh, something that uh, contributes to the disinformation. So just some 
basic uh, examples uh, historical events so <clears throat> the war in Iraq and Watergate scandal for example that was in 1972 so I can give more detail and you have in 90 you have Iraq war of course and the President Trump campaign, Hillary's Clinton emails. Okay, so all those, you know, events are happening. And uh, the last election in 2020 here, the baseless claim about fraud, all those things. And of course, we can think, we can also put uh, the January 2021 uh, attack on Congress as the result of the fact that people believed in what they heard because they were convinced by this repetition that it's, you know, even if they, didn't, they don't have evidence, they were still believing, okay? And the danger is uh, the, the, the fact that uh, at the end, people cannot think by themselves to try to distinguish, you know, what is the truth, you know, that. So just an example of uh, what happened in 1972, President Nixon, uh, announced that his uh, own investigation had determined that no one in this administration presently employed was involved in this very bizarre incident. So first he denied, right, as the president. Then he would come later, right, to say, oh, I'm sorry about what happened, okay? And at the end, he will, of course, uh, ask for the resignation of his uh, top uh, collaborators and later himself will, uh, of course, step down, okay? With 2016, 2020, so far back in the history, but most recently, 20, uh, 2016 election and 2020 presidential elections, denials. So we can see, for example, here how the former President Trump said he won the popular vote even if all data was kind of saying no, okay? What is interesting here is that for the last election, the 2021, all his team, they, you know, they sent, they, they tried uh, um, some, uh, some of the, uh, <coughs> we see on the, on the court and nothing, no, no one was, uh, you know, uh, Prove, uh, presented as true, okay? That that the the same uh, more than uh, fifty loose, uh, lawsuits were, you know, dismissed. So they did not bring the evidence that everyone was looking for. Okay? So that's how you deal with truth and uh, how you deal with truth. So to go now to the uh, connection between uh, misinformation. Um, they, they play with the truth and uh, democracy, propaganda and democracy. We can say here what I was saying present, uh, a few minutes ago is that uh, lies and propaganda can affect many countries, including okay, how people deal with human rights, how they, they deal, of course, with uh, democracy. So the danger is that not only it impairs free speech, but what is really important is the fact that people cannot think clearly anymore because we're so surrounded by lies, then that is what is really dangerous. We cannot make the distinction between fact and fiction, okay? And that is really uh, dangerous. And as we undermine democracy, we are building more autocracy autocratic uh, countries, autocratic political systems, right? In which we use election, but we still are able to, you know, undermine freedom, some uh, um, democratic principles, okay? By, we spread uh, false information, and it seems that more and more is kind of common and is kind of commonly accepted that people can spread, you know, wrong information and nothing happens, okay? So you have some news which are well known for spreading uh, conspiracy theories without any evidence and those are public and nothing happened to them, right? 
recently, I think only some of them have been sued, right? Uh, based on uh, someone who said that uh, the killing, mass killing of uh, children in Connecticut near my university was a hoax, right? And it has been for a long time, it's a couple of years ago, uh, but now I think only last year it was tried and uh, fined to pay a lot of money. Okay, so as long as we don't react to those lies and they are publicly operating, of course, we put it in danger our own uh, democracy. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to uh, end up here and I can show you briefly what, uh, what could be seen here as uh, how democracy is in peril using the uh, VDEM. I don't know if you guys know this uh, organization, but VDEM is uh, a variety for democracy. And I can show you briefly using some of the, uh, some of the uh, indicators there. So when you take the indicators like party dissemination of false information abroad, you have also party dissemination of false information domestic. You can see when you com when you combine all of those things, you can see the trend that what happened in 2020. Okay, the level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen in 2020 is down. So we can see that things are going down instead of improving. Electoral and closed autocracies are home to the majority of population. 68% of world population are living in autocracies. Okay? And liberal democracy diminished from 41 countries to, uh, in 2010 to 32. So we're obviously going down, okay? Instead of increasing the number of countries embracing democracy, we're seeing that it's going down. Okay? <clears throat> so this is just an example of uh, using some of, the, uh, some of the indicators that I showed you here. And I took one part of the world where people come from, okay? Here you have Middle East and North Africa, MENA. So when I use the freedom of expression and how freedom of expression is evolving, you can see the blue line. That is uh, some here in 2010. Here is higher here, but it's going down here in terms of uh, using the index. <laughs> and the government action against uh, media in terms of uh, censorship, you can also see the red one. And those are below the, uh, the minimum. So you can see here in 1980, and here too is coming here, how uh, the governments are you know, pushing in for censorship of media. Okay? So I can just briefly do something with you together. Uh, if we want to take so here is a, a variety of democracy okay and let's say we take and this is uh, pretty open you can uh, you can use it let's say we take a uh, uh, let's say, let's use Americas. Is that, is that okay for everyone? Okay. And for the indicator, let's see how it happens with party dissemination of information domestic. So you will also see that when we're talking about lies, it's also about you know, when the U.S. government told us that they are not checking our phones, they are not listening to us. I don't know if you remember at that sometime we had a scandal with uh, Snowden. Edward Snowden would, you know, would disclose that actually the U.S. government is listening U.S. citizens, and that was not right. But for a long time, and because of that, these guys, <laughs> these guys are out of the, the country. So. 
What I'm saying is that false information is not only for abroad. Government can also use you know, false information for domestic you know, uh, things. What other things we can use is uh, Let's use corrupt uh, media. OK. So what I'm trying to show you is that this is very interactive. And you can see things that you want to, you're really interested in, right? Some indicators that you're interested in. And you can pick the country or the region, the world that you're interested in and see, you know, how, what is the state of party dissemination of false information in Americas, right? You can see here. And they, they, study, they study here for uh, the dissemination only in 19, around 2000, OK? So that's what you see. They always take the minimum as you know, the reference to see, to study uh, what's interesting here. When we say we see the media, bias you see as of here how the media develop development of media development of technology also increase of course the bias of media okay and how this is really affecting uh uh if we want to add democracy for example democracy index we can add to see how they're interacting okay so that's something I wanted to show you. We can add whatever you want. It could be freedom, expression, other things to learn from this connection. So after the, after the, after the impact of lies and propaganda on democracy, I want to finish with how it's also uh, impacting us as you know, human beings by addressing the fact that once we start wars, right, you have people who are forcibly displaced. So that is how you have refugees in the world, but also refugees in your streets, refugees in your communities, right? If you see someone here, it's not necessarily because this person wanted to leave his or her country, but someone might have played on propaganda or on lies and carry out wars in his or her country for this person to look for you know a safe place right whether it's in Europe in Australia in in but I, I can tell you that the US is not the most uh, is not the biggest uh, host of refugees in the world maybe some of you know already who, who, the the nation which is hosting more refugees in the world, anyone? Yes. Is it Germany? Uh, Germany has a lot, but uh, <laughs> it's not Germany. Thank you, but uh, it's uh, in the Middle East. Okay. In... Okay. So here you have the refugees, but you have also the internal displaced person. You remember I told you I was myself internal displaced for eight years. And then you have the asylum seekers. If you want to know later, I can give you the chance okay, to talk about it. OK, so I want you all to be aware of what's, uh, what's happening, uh, where we went to try to bring democracy to you know, all things that we constructed propaganda about human rights here and why we need to send the people there and how Syria, Syrian refugees are in the world today. Every, everything went from uh, something like that war that uh, were related to the uh, massive, um, the weapons of uh, massive destruction, okay? And even if people are talking about ISIS today, of course, it's related to this invasion of the US army, uh, the invasion of Iraq by the US army and European armies, okay? so. I want to uh, stop here and uh, give uh, everyone the chance to ask questions. Uh, 
I want you to make the connection again between uh, misinformation, okay, the construction of you know information, how we purposely play with the truth, with the fact, and how this is uh, connected to the fact that we are undermining, you know, contributing to the decline of democracy, but also how we are uh, through that playing with some, you know, some people's human beings' life, sending them. Uh, in uh, in the street as a refugees. Thank you. Any questions? I'm happy to answer questions. Of course, I sent some of the readings. So if you have the chance to read, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. Or if you want to know more about my personal experience, I'm happy to. Yes. How did your story? How did your story specifically with scholars at risk like? With your, um, I'm sorry, I stopped really pushing up. Like, were you already so aware of this? And then, like, how did much more aware of these problems when you become out here and turning with them? New things that you notice? Uh, after I fled from my country, how do what I learned? Yeah, and just specifically from that experience. From that experience. Uh, I, I was, as a scholar, I was working on uh, issues related to the development because I'm from Africa, which is a continent where we still have, you know, a lot. Our main issue should be development, right? You know, will be so. I, 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 I was working on development issues, doing research on how we can develop our nations, our countries, you know. Uh, and based on my experience, I shifted my research, and now I'm doing research more on um, uh, uh, refugees, okay, humanitarian actions, and I'm reflecting on why we have refugees uh, in the world, and you know how can we change the narrative around refugees, okay? Um, that. Again, some people are seeing refugees, still seeing, I, I, I have one class that I, uh, which is uh, refugees and uh, culture in my anthropology class. And uh, I ask, I start the class by asking students, when you have, the, when you hear the term refugees, what, what, what comes in mind, in, in your mind? What, what, what are the first things that comes in mind? And it's, it, it's really interesting to see how, for many people, refugees means you know, uh, insecure people, refugees mean, you know, poverty, refugee means, uh, uh, some people will even think refugees as terrorists, you know, because of the, again, uh, the, the rhetoric, the propaganda, and the uh, purposely connection between 9-11, uh, for example, and, you know, Arabs, and uh, people coming from Middle East, and terrorism right or muslim and terrorism so you have this negative connection connotation between ref uh, when we talk about refugees and they never realize that um a lot of refugees are not people who say hey i want to leave my country <laughs> right that's why they forced displaced people right so I, that's, if I say, if I can say that I learned something or what I'm doing as a research is to try to, you know, write a, around this narrative, how to change things and believe that uh, I created with a, a group of uh, colleagues, we created something that we call share the platform, share the platform. Um, we, we think that many refugees have skills, they have talents, they have knowledge, you know, of course, as I told you, uh, I'm, myself, I'm even sometimes surprised that I can say a correct sentence in English because I did everything in French. I learned, and I did not come here when I was 20. I came here, I, you know, at very, you know, adult. And it's not easy to learn a new language as an adult. For my kids, it was like this, but for me, I did all my life. I was already publishing in my country. I was almost professor, full professor in my country when I came here. But I had to start over as an assistant professor. Then 
I'm uh, right now associate professor and uh, that's, you know, so I learned from that and uh, that things I want to, ch I want this narrative to change and in this share the platform initiative that I had with my colleagues, we trying to say if organizations or institutions like your school, right, want to share the platform with some refugees like us, we have some talent that we can share with everyone. If they want to give us the podium, if they want to give us a space, if they want to give us a room, right, on the podium, they can hear some, maybe some interesting things from us, right? And uh, uh, that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I learned from my experience and that's what I'm connecting to my work today. Thank you for your question. Anyone else? Yes, please. Um, so I come from an immigrant family. Mm -hmm. My family, they decided to come to America. Okay. It's their choice. I was just curious as to what caused um, you and your family to be pushed out of the country. So it was basically because of the war. As I said, in 2002, I was uh, displaced from my you know, town to the capital city. So for eight years, we were in the middle of the crisis, but not war yet. In 2010, when we held the presidential election that was supposed to end the crisis, then it turned into a civil war. And I can tell you, civil war is also one of the dirtiest, dirtiest war in, uh, on earth. Because civil wars means people are looking at your identity, right? They're looking at, and for me it was even crazy because they were looking at my they were looking at my ethnicity, they were looking at my origin, I'm from the west of the country, so when they look at the west of the country, they know that uh, people in that part of the country, are, we call them Bete, so they were looking for specific people of this to kill, right? Because they were fighting a president who is a Bete, so I don't know this guy. Right? I have nothing to do with him. But because I'm from his ethnic group, so I'm a target. Unfortunately for me, again, this guy was a professor at the university. And I'm, uh, you know, a student, like, uh, you know, I'm a, a professor. Uh, that was in 2002, I was a student, but in 2010, now I was professor, right? So again, for them, someone who is a baby, who is from the West, who is a professor at the university, I'm kind of checking all points for those rebels. I'm a good target to kill because this guy is a professor. That means it's the same you know, kind of uh, think tank with the president. Again, I'm not from his, I wasn't from his political party. I don't know him. I don't have any connection with this guy. But that was enough. And was this guy in my country, his name is Babo. Babo is G B A G B O. My name is Babo. As you can imagine, in terms of sound for red for the rebels, they don't care. The difference for them, Babo, Babo is the same. So people will be tracking me down, you know, go to my house, try to, you know, get to catch me. Okay. So that's, hap that's what happened to me. That's how I had to flee with my family. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking. But I was wondering, what can you do as youth to better understand the perspective of refugees? Hmm, that's a great question. Hmm. So first, I would like uh, uh, the course that I'm, t I'm, I'm, I'm teaching at Fairfield University is what we call a community service course. Uh, now we call, the, we call it a community learning course. So we want students to learn while taking class, learn better by being part of the process, right? And by talking to refugees, because many people talk about refugees, but they have never met a refugee. 
And in my class, when at the end of the class, I ask them, do you have, you know, can you learn, have you, have you heard about a very prominent refugee in this country, in the United States, or someone that you know as a refugee, you know, uh, which became, you know, very prominent political person or, you know, public figure. Of course, they will list many. Anyone you know in the on campus here who is a refugee, they never thought about myself being standing before them, because for them, they cannot imagine, right? <laughs> You know, for again, as I say, for them, refugees, someone who's uh, you know, uneducated, who has. So I thought that making the young people meet the actual refugees will probably contribute to change the way of seeing, you know, and you know, separate them uh, their, their thoughts from what they hear every time from the media, right? Uh, so that's for me. Don't be afraid of. Uh, making a connection with refugee communities. If we can go there, go there and learn from them, learn where they come from, learn their culture, you know, uh, try to, 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 to learn better about what sent them out. And that will probably change your way of seeing what refugee means and also who are the refugees. And at that point, you will see that all of us are, you know, potential refugees because it happens sometimes overnight and you have to grab just a couple of things to leave. For me, as I said at the beginning, when I heard that I had to leave, you look at your house and you, uh, you have maybe 30 minutes or someone say you have 20 minutes to leave the place. What do you take? And things are racing in your brain. You know, you, you don't have you don't have the time. What do I take first? What do I leave here? What you know? How do I grab all those things? Right. So sometimes, sometimes people take pictures, photos, something that you will never replace. You never find because you're going there. You don't never know when you come back. Maybe you will never come back. Right. Uh, when I was younger, it was easy for me. I, as I said, I, I just collected my dissertation, right? That was, uh, and uh, I left. But it's so, it's so hard when you and some, when you leave, don't 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 look at behind you, otherwise you would be, you know, uh, it's 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 hard to leave your house, to leave everything you have built there, and to go. Right? And sometimes you go without knowing where you are going. You, you just go. You don't know where you're going. And you don't even know what fate is waiting for you there, the, the other side. The point is just to save your life. And then later, as long as you're alive, you can start over. That's the point. I hope I answer your question. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Do you need the mic? How you try to tell the truth if people don't want to hear it? Oh. I would say uh, we need to be persistent because otherwise, if we drop, right? If we 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 don't push, uh, the truth will win and the, the lies will win. And sometimes people tell, as I said, for example, for the video about what uh, uh, Colin Powell said at the UN. People were already dead. Many people were refugees. And it was uh, years later that they acknowledged that it wasn't true. But we cannot afford to continue to do that, right? We cannot killing people and 20 years later say, oh, we're sorry, you know, that was a lie. Or, you know, 
So we need to anticipate. We need, as young people, to try to find the facts and the way liars are spreading the lies. We also need to use the same avenue, the same technology, maybe to spread and maybe overspread the truth. That's probably the way to do that. Otherwise, if we say, because no one wants to hear, then we're not doing anything, then we stop. I'm sorry, but, <laughs> right? Yeah, so we need to be, you know, we need to find ways, we need to be creative, we need to find things, but uh, uh, that's a great question. It's, uh, and I, I would like to let that to you, young generation. Right? You, you need to find ways to really spread the truth. And as I said, be critical. There is no alternative fact. Fact are fact. Yeah. We cannot say, oh, you know, this dimension, this aspect is not here. No. So that's, I, I hope I answered your question, but thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you for, for, for the talk. Uh, some interesting things to think about. Um, Alfred will be around for a few minutes, so if you do have questions that you want to ask him and hear him, we'll be able to do that. Otherwise, thank you all. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you.